Time Warner Audio Books presents Wayland, the Autobiography. Written by Wayland Jennings and Lenny Kay. And presented by Wayland Jennings. I've always been crazy in the trouble that it's put me through. I've been busted for things that I did, I didn't do. I can't say I'm proud of all of the things that I've done. But I can say I've never intentionally hurt anyone. I've always been different with one foot over the line. Winding up somewhere, one step ahead of the time. It ain't been so easy, but I guess I shouldn't complain. I've always been crazy, kept me from going insane. Nighttime. Highway. I've seen this unraveling dream many times before. Endless distance flicking white stripes on a blacktop, riding along. I sit in the shotgun seat, arms folded across my chest like an old Native American, staring out at the exit signs, the north, the south, backs and forths, criss and crosses, a life in between. I'm enjoying this. You know how to get it out of somebody. Every time I talk to you, I come up with something else that I remember. Now, some of it's not that pretty but I'm proud of most of it. There's a lot to sort out, put in perspective. I've been there and I've been here and wherever I'll be tomorrow. Sometimes I feel like I've gone around about twice. You're talking to a guy who never went to sleep. I've lived a couple of lifetimes. Maybe that's why I don't feel tired tonight. We can stay up late, watch the road, count off the miles. You want to get started? Storms boil up out of the west, a red-black cloud taking over the sky, streaming across the New Mexico border into Texas. You can stand there and watch them coming at you. Nothing to stop them on the high, open plains, 70, 80, 90 mile an hour wind, moving like a dark horse across the flat land, bringing sand and dust and tumbleweeds. I've seen chickens go to roost at noon, it'd be so dark. The wind howls through those old tar paper houses, and the sand sifts across the road till you can't tell where the blacktop begins, and the grit gets in your teeth. Now, many a time I'd be going home when I was a kid, running down the street, trying to beat the storm. I'd have to stop and grab a hold of a pole to keep them getting blown away. Lonesome. Now, that's what Mama used to call the noise that the wind made. And it haunts me to this day. It sounds like the end of time. And sometimes I think I made music to shut out the wind, to find a place where the sands can't touch and the air smells sweet and clear, like a spring morning after a rain. It rained a lot that spring I was born. More than eight inches fell in two weeks before I arrived, bringing with it the hope of a bumper cotton crop and the toil of replanting. We were on the fringes, seven or so miles northeast of Littlefield, on Tuesday morning, June 15, 1937, Mama went up to the main farmhouse owned by Mr. and Mrs. J.W. Bentner, Sr., and birthed me. Daddy got to celebrate his first Father's Day that next Sunday. My coming wasn't recorded in the Lamb County News or Leader, downtown where Norma Shearer and Leslie Howard were starring in Romeo and Juliet, and the society pages were fussing about the Duchess of Windsor. They paid no notice to what was happening to us sharecroppers working in the field. Dirt poor, and we had the floor to prove it. We shared a two-room house with my uncles and aunts and cousins. The bed was in the living room, and then there was the kitchen. Twelve people. I don't know how we did it. 
My dad was the hardest working man I ever saw. He did everything at one time or another. He worked in the fields, ran a creamery, he owned a gas station, and drove a fuel truck. One time he broke his back. He had been working over in Hobbs, New Mexico, and a piece of lumber fell on him. He got out of the hospital in a back brace and immediately went and pulled cotton. It hurt so bad that he had to do it on his knees, but he wanted to get some money together so we could have a Christmas. It was never easy for our family, even after Mom and Daddy moved over to the Bentner farm. One time I remember my dad sitting in a chair and crying. His head was in his hands. Daddy had worked sun up, sun down on the farm and then milked 20 head of cattle, and we still didn't have anything to eat. A dollar a day was what he made. Yet it wasn't a rare thing to see him laugh. He laughed a lot. When he smiled, the whole room lit up. Kids trusted him. My dad could walk up to a child, and they might be bashful and shy and turning away. But in just a few minutes, they'd be right over there cuddling next to him. He was constantly joking. Daddy finally got him enough money together to buy a truck. He had a 41 Ford short bed, a bobtail, they called him. We were doing all right for a while, even if Mama tells a story of how she had to put me up on the stove while she was cleaning the house to keep the rats from getting me. <laughs> That's kind of country, ain't it? They were originally going to name me Wayland, W-A-Y-L-A-N-D. Land by the highway. It's no wonder I've spent my life on the road. But when a Baptist preacher stopped by to visit Mama and said, Oh, I see you've named your son after our wonderful Wayland College in Plainview. Well, she immediately changed the spelling to W-A-Y-L-O-N. Now, we were solid Church of Christ, saved by baptism instead of faith. She never got around to switching it on the birth certificate. But for a while, I didn't like Wayland. It sounded corny and hillbilly to me. But it's been good to me, and I'm pretty well at peace with it now. When you're born in Texas, you think you're a little bit taller, a little bit smarter, and a whole lot tougher than anybody else. Now, when you get out in the world and find out you ain't, that's a grand awakening. It's a country unto itself. It really is, because it's the only state that was a country before it was a state. And people who live there still feel that way. My wife, Jessie, hit it right on the head. She says they think the rest of the world is overseas. Of course, she's from Arizona, and she knows what it's like being around the cowboys. We could just dream about being cowboys. For us, life on the farm was all we could look forward to. Littlefield is part of the cotton belt, and it sits a straddle of the line between the dry land farming on the west side and wet irrigation on the east. And we pulled cotton all around Littlefield, getting up at four in the morning to be in the field before dawn. It would already be so hot and dry that the gnats would be swarming in your eyes, trying to get at the moisture. By the time the day was too hot for them, we'd be halfway down the row, hunched over, dodging snakes, pulling the bowls and chopping at them, trying to get to the other end where the water jar was. There's a saying he's in high cotton now, which means it's easier to pull or to pick it. You don't have to bend over. Now, for low cotton, which is thicker on the bush, well, you haven't lived till you've bent over all the way down the row, which is about three-quarters of a mile long, and then try standing up and straightening up your back. Or bending over to get the stuff, pulling a kid on a sack who's crying. My mama pulled bowls. We didn't pick it like they did in East Texas. We pulled the bowl and the cotton off the cotton stalk. Then we'd have the cotton gin that would separate the bowl from the seed. The bowl was green, and when it dried out, it would open up and be real brittle. It could really cut your hands if you didn't wear gloves. You know, there's nothing I've ever heard in my life as mournful as a whistle of an old freight train in the distance when you're kneeling down in a field. It sounds like death. Now, I'd be in the cotton patch dragging a 12-foot sack, about half full, putting dirt clods in there to make it weigh more and I'd hear that lonesome old howl, and it goes right through you. I was sure that that train was on its way to somewhere, and I wasn't on it. I knew there's a better way somewhere. I didn't know where, but all I had to do was go looking.